Hi, my name is John Pinizzato, and I'm a director at the College Board for AP Physics, and I'm here with Dr. Brian Green, uh, who is here to talk to us about mechanics and relativity and the next steps that physics is taking. Uh, Dr. Brian Green, if you could introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, you know, your, your background in physics. Sure, happy to. I'm Brian Green, professor of physics and mathematics at Columbia University. I'm also a co-founder of the World Science Festival. And I got into physics way back in high school, loved mathematics, but then when I learned that math could actually describe the world, that changed everything for me. And that's really where my passion for studying things like quantum mechanics and quantum gravity and string theory and cosmology comes from. So that's sort of the heart of what I do. I also bring signs to general audiences through, I've written books, television shows, theatrical pieces that we've had on PBS, exploring the discovery of general relativity of all things. So, and through the World Science Festival, my other hat, if you will, we create all sorts of programming for the public that's meant to get people excited about these ideas and to give them a way into the cutting edge without having to go to graduate school. So that's, that's pretty much what I do. Well, that's really good. I think that the ability to take really complicated, complex concepts and distill them down into accessible things, like you were saying, like to the, the general masses of uh, quantum mechanics has a, a very, um, I don't know, it has a reputation, right, for being this inaccessible thing. And, and so uh, I think it's a great thing that we're doing to try and bring that down to people where uh, it's accessible, because it, it is, it's incredibly interesting. And um, yeah. I'm excited to talk to you about it today. Great. The first thing today, I, I think, so the, one of the first courses that we have for AP Physics C Mechanics is, uh, which is what we're talking about today. So, but a lot of teachers, myself included, when I was in the classroom, we never really bothered to define mechanics, right? So yeah. if you were going to give me uh, a definition of what it means when we talk about mechanics in physics class, what would you say that is? Mechanics is the study of how and why things move. Easy peasy. So then what would classical mechanics or Newtonian mechanics, we would throw those terms around a lot too, right? So classical mechanics or Newtonian mechanics, uh, what, what does that mean to you? Yeah, well, uh, classical mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, it does come from the insights of Isaac Newton in the late 1600s, who was the first person to really put the power of mathematics behind our understanding of motion in the world around us. So Newton famously gave us his three laws of motion. And those laws are incredibly powerful at describing the kinds of motion that we can see with the naked eye, the kinds of motion that we encounter in day-to-day -day life. And so that is the body, that, a body of physics that has been developed since the late 1600s in which we can predict the motion of planets. We can predict the motion of comets. We can predict the motion of baseballs. And it all works. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's utterly amazing. And it was, to, for me, again, personally, my AP physics class, I remember one specific problem that the teacher gave us. I'm trying to remember the teacher's name. I think it was Hirshhorn. Mr. Hirshhorn gave us this problem where you had a, a baseball attached by a piece of chewing gum, an, an elastic connection to a ceiling. And you had to calculate the motion of the swinging baseball as the elastic stretched. And I, I sat down, I solved this problem. I remember it was in my room. I ran out to my dad, showed him the answer, this formula that predicted the motion. And to me, it was just this amazing thing that you didn't have to do the experiment. You could just figure it out. And, and that's really where my love of the subject really was sparked. It was around that time, that problem is one that sticks in my mind as a linchpin moment. It's interesting you say that. I, I, re, I remember a similar moment, and I, and I think of talking to a lot of physics teachers and, uh, and mathematicians really, like I think there's a common thread there where there's a, like a linchpin moment, like you said, of like, like this, this kind of eureka moment of that's when I realized that that mathematics and physics is, is so cool. And, and for me, it was, it was actually in my AP calculus course, but it's a very similar moment of like, oh, this is this incredible uh, description that you have of the universe using mathematics uh, yeah. that was previously inaccessible. 
Um, so, so my question, I, I guess, to follow up on, on Newton's laws, because to me, the, the three laws, right, seem so intuitive, right? And maybe that's, you know, the advantage that, that I have being uh, a physicist and having experience teaching for a, a long time and those kinds of things. But, but given the fact that they seem, I think, on face value, incredibly intuitive, why do you think that they're not, right? So, so, so students even now, um, you know, Newton's first law, the things are going to keep going, right? Or so, you know, the classic example, you know, you let the comet go and it just keeps going, right? So, so why do you, what, what about motion do you think is so uh, non-intuitive that New, when Newton published his, his laws, it, it was a, this revolutionary landmark thing? Yeah, well, two things there. First off, you know, Aristotle was a pretty smart fellow, but he got motion pretty wrong. Because right. Aristotle was guided by direct experience. And in direct experience, if an object, you shove it along a table, it doesn't keep on going forever, right? Now, we all know why it slows down ultimately to a stop, because there's friction, and that friction drains energy from the motion and turns it into heat. But that took some thought to really recognize that if you had a sufficiently, infinitely smooth tabletop that didn't have any friction, the puck that you set going along the surface would keep going forever. We've never experienced that. So our intuition needs to be tweaked. It needs to be informed by the power of thought. And that's what Newton was able to do. And once Newton articulates, and once you realize, yeah, the smoother the table gets, the farther the puck goes, and you make it smoother still and it goes even further, then you can intuit, you can extrapolate to the special case of no friction, and then it becomes intuitive. But it's not in our everyday experience. So that's one thing. Newton really had to go a little beyond everyday experience to figure out what was really going on. But number two is, Newton was able to show that there are these abstract symbols that we call mathematics that we've been talking about. And these abstract symbols actually are able to describe with quantitative precision what's happening with motion. And that's again, not something that we have any intuition about. Most of our brains don't undertake Newtonian calculations. Rather, we just have a sense of what's going on we can roughly say where the baseball is gonna land if we throw it. We can't predict it with precision without using the math. And that's what Newton gave us. So that's a revolutionary moment where we see that there is this body of, 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 of math, this language for describing the world that is incredibly powerful. And that's, that's really where Newton took us. So, so that's a really good lead into the next point here of, of using the mathematics to make predictions, right? Which um, is, is incredibly powerful. Like, that's kind of the whole point, in, in, in my opinion, right? Like, you're, we're using this math. You want to predict where the baseball lands. So, so where is it, or where did we first start to find the, these gaps, right, where the predictions that we use with Newtonian mechanics doesn't quite line up with uh, what we observe, right? So we're using our, our natural experience, or maybe not natural experience. We're using our experience. We're making observations. Uh, and then what we predict happens isn't quite what happens. So what are the first things? that started to lead us to believe that maybe New Newtonian mechanics wasn't the, the whole story? Well, there really are two, and they each yield their own revolution in our understanding. First has to do with scientists that began to study not rocks and planets, but rather light. They began to study light in the late 1800s. And the scientists, such as Michael Faraday and James Clark Maxwell and others, realized that light was not behaving in the way that Newton would have thought. Light was exhibiting some strange properties with respect to its motion. And it took Albert Einstein to really figure out how to fix that problem. And with that, Einstein takes us to the special theory of relativity, which goes beyond Newton's theory. Another insight was that the planet Mercury wasn't precisely following the Newtonian orbit. It was really close to the Newtonian orbit, but it was deviating from the prediction of Newton by a little bit. It took Albert Einstein to figure out that particular problem. That took us to the general theory of relativity. And I really should say there's really a third revolution in here, which is as scientists began to study particles, 
in the early part of the 20th century, these could be particles of light, like photons, particles of matter, like electrons. They found way down on tiny scales, those particles were not following the trajectories that Newton would have predicted if those particles behaved like a baseball or a rock. And that took, again, Albert Einstein, but a whole generation of physicists to develop quantum physics. So these are sort of the three ideas that naturally emerge as people began to go beyond Newton's understanding of the world. So you said, so Albert Einstein gets a significant amount of the credit for setting the first steps in here. And, and, and yep. reading about Albert Einstein, it completely blows my mind, right? So here you have this, this, this kid for all, all practical purposes, this 20, what, he's 26, 25 year old kid. Yeah. And, and he's working in an office job somewhere, right? Some, uh, you know, boring drab office at the, the patent clerk office. And then he, he just, he, he keeps up in his spare time with like the current cutting edge physics research. And then, and he figures it out. Right. And then, and then he, he sends off his, his paper to the, to the journal and then, you know, the, the rest is history. Right. So, I mean, it's just absolutely completely, it, it floors me to think about, you know, this, this relatively unknown person. So, so what were those things that, that Albert Einstein, what were those pieces that he was able to put together yeah. to answer and explain those questions that, that, the side, you know, other people up until him were unable to do. Yeah, well, y your description is, is right on target, but I would just give one small additional detail that's sort of a curiosity too, which is in the patent office, Einstein was charged, one of the things that he was charged with doing in the patent office in Geneva was to look at proposals for how you might synchronize distant clocks. It was a very practical problem that was being faced on the continent at the time because trains were just starting to be a dominant mode of travel. And if you have trains that are starting at distant locations in Europe, you better be certain that their clocks are synchronized because if there's a single track and you don't want one that was supposed to be there at 10 o'clock showing up at 11 o'clock when another train in the opposite direction was supposed to be on that track. So, so there was a real practical issue here that you had to learn how to synchronize distant clocks. In the old days, people would synchronize clocks by just looking at the sun. When the sun is overhead, that's 12 noon. But that's pretty imprecise. It also depends on where you are. So these are issues. So Einstein is deeply embedded in this issue of synchronizing clocks. And as he begins to delve ever more deeply, he realizes that there is a profound issue that goes beyond train travel. He realizes that there is a profound issue with light and the way it travels, distinct from what Newton would have thought, that ultimately causes him to revolutionize our understanding of time itself. He realizes that the notion of simultaneity that everybody had thought was a universal notion, you say something happens at 12 noon, I say something happens at 12 noon, then everybody in the world must agree that those two events happen simultaneously. Einstein said, no, it is not the case. Simultaneity depends on how you are moving. Two observers in relative motion do not agree on those things that happen at the same moment. Oh my God, that's insane. <laughs> and yet that's what emerges from Albert Einstein in the patent office thinking about synchronizing clocks and how light behaves. So that's the first big insight. The, it, it, I've heard multiple stories. I, um, I'm reminded of another, of another story of, with Richard Feynman when he was, it, he indicated like another thing where he was investigating how a, how a plate wobbles, right? Yeah. And this, this, this plate wobbling led him down this, this path, this unexpected path of, uh, you know, leading to his research. And it's, it's always interesting to me to hear those stories of, you know, the, the, the triggers for what really propels people to find yeah. the things yeah. they find. So, so we have these things, is there evidence? So, so one of the things we like to teach students in class, right? Like is this evidence to support uh, these claims, right? So he writes this paper, you know, and the math all checks out, the math, the math looks good. Um, but then, so we have all these things, right? So that, you know, two observers aren't gonna measure the same event uh, at, this, at the same time, depending on how they're moving relative to each other, which is this completely absurd idea on face value, right? So yeah. um, what evidence do we have to support uh, th those claims, right, that, that the universe is this weird kind of funky place when it comes to how you're moving relative to somebody else. 
Yeah, well, there's a lot of evidence, and it's good for students to recognize that evidence comes in a variety of flavors, a variety of forms. One body of evidence is evidence that establishes that the speed of light is constant, that the speed of light is an invariant number, 671 million miles per hour, 300 million meters per second, one foot per nanosecond, whatever units you'd like, it is a fixed number. That is a crazy idea in its own right, because look, baseballs don't have a fixed speed, depends how you are moving relative to them. Trains don't have a fixed speed, it depends how you and the train are moving relative to one another. But with light, Einstein said, there is no relative notion of its speed. It's a fixed universal. Now, that idea of the constant nature of the speed of light then implies the weirdness of simultaneity. So if you have a lot of evidence for the constant nature of the speed of light, that's indirect evidence for the conclusion that comes from that fact about the world. So, that, so there's a lot of evidence where people have measured the speed of light in all sorts of circumstances always get the same result. But there's even more direct in this particular case evidence, not indirect evidence, because this weirdness of time shows, according to Einstein, that clocks that are moving relative to each other, they will tick off time at different rates. They will tick off time at different rates. So in the 1970s, two researchers took an atomic clock, very, very precise clock. They put it on the tarmac at an airport. They took another atomic clock. They put it in the passenger seat of an airplane and they flew that plane around the world. And Einstein would predict that when the clocks come back together, they won't have the same reading. They will have fallen out of synchronization because the motion of the clock and the gravity experienced by the clock will affect its motion the one that's on the airplane. And indeed, when they compared the two clocks after this round the world journey, the clocks did differ. They were no longer in sync. They were not having simultaneous readings of the same number. And the difference between them, the discrepancy was just what Einstein's math predicted. Well, I mean, that's the most straightforward evidence you can have for time behaving in a way that you wouldn't think based on everyday experience. So, um, so what's, are, are there, so, so like with Newton, right, we start observing some of these things um, and, and we start having these holes, right, these gaps where, where Newton's uh, explanations don't quite line up with what we're observing. Yeah. Um, right now, so, so, we, so, so Einstein comes along and, and he, he fills a lot of those holes, right? So, um, you know, Mercury's orbit, which you mentioned earlier, is, is explained, right, by this, this weirdness of, of motion and the, this clocks uh, not being synchronized, and which we use now with, with like GPS satellites and things like that. So we have these things that are explained now by, uh, you know, Einstein's addition to the Newtonian baseline. Do, are there things that we are observing now in either, you know, in the universe or in the lab or, uh, you know, wherever that are starting to poke holes or, or, or show the gaps maybe in Einstein's explanation for the, the universe. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the most fruitful areas of cutting edge research today is the subject of black holes. And black holes are an idea that emerges from Einstein's equations of the general theory of relativity, the version of relativity that he developed that was capable of giving us an explanation of Mercury's orbit. And within that mathematics, there was a, a German mathematician physicist named Carl Schwarzschild right back in 1916, who showed that within Einstein's theory, if you had enough mass collapsed, squeezed together to a sufficiently small size, you would create a black hole, a region of space where the gravitational pull is so enormous that absolutely nothing can escape not even a beam of light. That's why this region of space goes dark. That's why it's black. And the amazing thing is just an hour ago, two hours ago, I learned, the world learned that the Nobel Prize in physics this year was awarded to scientists whose insights gave us a deeper understanding of black holes. Roger Penrose at Oxford, who was actually my first graduate school advisor, he won the Nobel Prize for mathematical results that established that the insight of Carl Schwarzschild back in 1916 is quite general, that a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity is the existence of black holes. That was mathematics. And then uh, two other 
physicists, Andrea Ghez, one of them, who's someone I know quite well, observations that these team of astronomers made of the center of the Milky Way galaxy, where they show that stars are whipping around the center of our galaxy at such incredibly high speeds and with such tight orbits that the only thing that could be responsible for their motion is an incredibly massive black hole, four million times the mass of our sun sitting at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So they deserve great congratulations, but now taking it to your question, we theorists are pushing the understanding of black holes even further and finding puzzles uh, that are arising. When we try to understand quantum physics, the physics of the very small, how it interfaces with Einstein's theory of gravity, a theory of very big things, especially in the example of black holes, we're coming upon mathematical curiosities. We're coming upon conclusions that don't seem to fully make sense. And so the next few years of research ahead of us is going to be a pretty exciting time as we try to sort out what new theory needs to take the place of Einstein's theory when our understanding is pushed to the limits. And black holes do just that. They push our understanding to the limits. So, so you mentioned this earlier um, with, with, with quantum mechanics being the study of the very small. And, and I think that many students are familiar with this idea that, you know, you have uh, gravity is this big thing that holds the universe together and then the very small how electrons and protons or even the smaller pieces in that are interacting with each other and that they don't they don't jive together very very well or or at all right so so my question would be like what does that mean right like because we, we kind of gloss over that in class right like oh like they, they don't work together they don't, they don't play nice right but but we don't ever really explain that in any more detail so can you give me a little more detail about what is it that how gravity and the physics of the very small don't agree with each other? Yeah, so let me give you two quick answers to it. One at a more qualitative level is that in Einstein's view of the universe, space and time are described as a structure that can, that can warp and curve. And it's the warps and curves in space time that is what transmits the force of gravity. So when an object is falling, it's sliding down an indentation in the space-time fabric, like rolling down a slide. That's Einstein's vision. And the key thing about Einstein's vision is the shape of space is always nice and gently curving. It doesn't have any extreme parts where it, it kinks or bends in a really dramatic way. When quantum mechanics gets into the story, however, we find something called the uncertainty principle, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And that tells us that in any region of space, there's always a great deal of fluctuating behavior, a great deal of tumult that's coming from the fact that we can't nail down all features with complete precision because of this uncertainty that comes from us, comes from Heisenberg. When you put those together, it says that if you examine the fabric of space time on very small scales, it will be undergoing wild undulations, even ripping apart perhaps and coming back together in ways that Einstein's vision couldn't, cannot cope with. Einstein's math can't cope with it. And that's where the two theories really come into tension. Now, mathematically, just for the students that really want to think a little bit more detail about these things, when you undertake a calculation, for instance, about black holes, the center of black holes, that involves Einstein's math, Einstein's equation, r mu nu minus a half g mu nu r because a pi g over c to the fourth t mu nu. When you take that equation and you try to blend it with Schrodinger's equation, you know, i h bar d psi d t equals h psi. When you try to put these together, the number that comes out of many calculations is infinity. Infinity, hmm. what kind of an answer is that? I mean, Infinity is generally a signature that we don't know what's going on, that something's gone wrong. It's like when you divide one by zero on a calculator, it says error, infinity or error. And we're kind of getting the infinity or error when we put the equations of Einstein and quantum mechanics together. That's the problem. That's a, all right. So I have a question that I personally want to ask. And, and so this is, is another thing that I, I used to raise up in class a lot of times, and, and it comes with maybe trying to, to blend gravity with with how particles interact and so this would be newton's law of gravitation 
uh, and then Coulomb's law of attraction or repulsion. And, and they look yeah. so strikingly similar, right? Like, I mean, they're basically identical, only, you know, you have mass instead of charge and you have K instead of G, right? But they're basically the same. So do you have any um, explanation for, or, or does the universe have an explanation for why those two interactions would, would have the same general feel and look to them? Yeah, there is a, a way of thinking about it, which is that if you use the line of force model that we often teach students, which is not a bad way of thinking about things, where if you have a mass at a center, the gravitational field radially emanates from that mass, or if you have a charge, the lines of the electric field emanate from that source, that charge source, and when lines spread out in three dimensions, their density drops by a factor of R squared because the area of a sphere surrounding any object at the origin, the area of that sphere, four pi R squared, grows like R squared. So the density of the lines drops by R squared. And that's the origin of the one over R squared term in both the Newtonian gravitational force and in the Coulomb law for the uh, electromagnetic or the electric attraction or repulsion. And, and so that's, that's the dominant term in each of those equations, the fact that it drops by R squared. And uh, the fact that each involves, uh, say, an M1 and an M2 or a Q1 and a Q2 is the statement that two sources will interact by that field and the strength of that interaction will drop by R squared for the reasons that I just described. So that's not a bad reason for thinking about the similarity between them. It does raise two interesting points. Number one, the R squared is tightly connected to the number of dimensions of space, three dimensions of space. If the universe had four or five dimensions of space, it wouldn't be a two in the bottom. And there's some cutting edge theories that suggest that the number of dimensions might not just be three. And so there are experiments that examine, say, the gravitational force on very small scales trying to find a deviation from the one over R squared behavior that might suggest that on very small scales, there are additional dimensions that become available to that force field. No positive results yet, but that's something right at the cutting edge that's connected to this very basic formula that we all learn way back even before high school. The second thing that I might note is that there is a big difference too between the Newton formula and the, uh, electric attraction repulsion formula, which is that in Coulomb's law, the charges can be positive or negative. In the Newtonian gravitational, the mass can only be positive. And that's a significant difference between them because it suggests that whereas you can have positive attraction or negative repulsion for the electric case that you only have the attraction for gravity. That's what Newton would say. Einstein's theory actually goes beyond that and allows for repulsive gravity. Repulsive gravity, that's something we don't teach students when we're talking about gravity. And it's not just an interesting idea. Our cutting edge theories of cosmology, of the Big Bang, suggest that the Big Bang was actually driven by the repulsive version of gravity that the source of gravity in the early universe was of the repulsive variety, pushed everything apart. And so the entire universe, we think, may have the form that it does because of the fact that gravity can be repulsive too. Okay, that's incredible. And uh, I'm going to tell my wife this because she likes to poke me about physics, right? So she, she likes to, to, to kind of needle me and she says, uh, you know, John, what if there's a repulse of gravity? And then I apparently ignorantly said, well, we don't see that ever. ever. So, you know, that would be a big thing if we could find this. And so yeah. now I get to go tell her that Brian Greene said that, you know, there's, you know, that might may have driven the big bang, which is absolutely incredible. And then, uh, I, anyway, okay. So what is the next step then? So you hinted at this uh, with more dimensions and, you know, the cutting edge things that are being done right now uh, to try and, Either, either prove or disprove, right? Like some of our, our theories about the, these cutting edge, wh where we push ourselves to the extremes of these uh, explanations for things. So um, I remember sort of, you know, when I was in high school, uh, string theory was just starting to become 
uh, you know, it was, it was this, this baby little discipline, like it was brand new and was all over the news and, um, you know, physicists and scientists, you know, string theory, string theory. Now, either because I, you know, I became uh, distracted by my family and kids and whatnot and I'm not in, in the research uh, game where it's like, but that seems to have taken, um, it's not as quite as, as mainstream popular in the media as maybe I remember it being. So my question is, is that still the, the most current, or I guess maybe I have two questions. One, so what is string theory, right? So how would you explain that in layman's terms? And two, is that still the direction that the cutting edge physicists such as yourself and others are, are leaning towards trying to explain um, some of the, these awkward behaviors between the very big and the very small? Yeah, so, so for the what is string theory, what you just described is what string theory attempts to accomplish. It tries to build a bridge between Einstein's theory of gravity, general relativity, and the laws of the small, namely quantum mechanics. And the theory does this by modeling matter in a different way. So when we teach kids about the particles that make up stuff in the world, we really describe them as little tiny dots on the blackboard, little tiny infinitesimal particles. And string theory posits that that shape is perhaps not accurate. That if you were to examine what we call particles on incredibly small scales, you'd find that they're little filaments. The filaments could have open ends or they could be loops. And these little filaments look like little pieces of vibrating string. And that's where the name string theory comes from. And that's the picture. Of course, we have a whole body of mathematics that describes how these strings move, how they vibrate, and remarkably, within the mathematics of string theory, without putting it in from the get-go, we can pull out Einstein's equations of general relativity. If you didn't know Einstein's equations of general relativity, but you discovered string theory first, maybe the history of science on a different planet went in that direction, they would have extracted what we call Einstein's equations for gravity, general relativity, from string theory. So. This is a very exciting proposal for putting quantum mechanics and general relativity together. And you're right, in the 1980s, way before most people who are watching this were even born, 1990s, there's great excitement about this development. And what happens with the media and physics is that when there's a new idea, it's the new kid on the block, Everybody clamors to talk about it, to be the first person out there breaking the news, which is exciting. There's nothing wrong with that. But then in the natural course of events, a subject matures. It's no longer the new kid on the block. It doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. It just means that the media is focused upon the fresh, new, shiny thing that the public hasn't heard about yet. So that's one reason why perhaps there's less focus. But another reason is that String theory has gone through, as any field of science does, its ups and its downs. There have been periods of incredible excitement in the last 10, 15 years, some of which have been modestly covered by the press. And there have been moments of despair when we've come upon things in the theory that are so surprising and shocking that we think, well, maybe the theory can't be right. The possibility of other universes the possibility of a whole range of mathematical solutions to the equations that are so numerous that we can't possibly examine all of them. So we wonder how we ever gonna get a handle on the predictions of this theory. And so these are the natural problems in research. Research is not all rosy and excitement. Every day you go to the office, you discover something new, you call the New York Times. No, research is hard. And most of the time, you're confused. Most of the time, you're in the dark. Most of the time, you're wondering, maybe I should change fields and work on something else because this is pretty tough and I'm not making any money kind of thing. You know, so <laughs> there's, it's not an easy life. But in the end, we hope, and most of the time, we find that collectively, we work together. We really pool our intelligence and our, and our in industry to, to make progress. And we do. And right now, the state of the field is, is, is exciting and healthy. Many open problems, but many insights that none of us really would have anticipated 20 years ago that are very exciting. So I, I think, 
your last bit about, you know, research isn't all exciting and there's moments of frustration and despair. I, I think that's, that's really powerful, especially to the AP physics student who I think very quite often feels uh, powerless over the content and despair and, and frustrated. And, you know, maybe I should just switch majors. Maybe I should just do something easier. Um, be, because, because it is, it's, it's, it's hard. It turns out, right. Physics, physics is difficult. Math, math is hard. And especially the first time through, um, you know, even for Newton, right, that we talked about at the beginning here, where it's, it seems so, so intuitive now, right, but the first time it happened, it was this incredible leap, right? So what would you say to, to high school physics students who, who are in that sort of, that, that, that pit of despair, so to speak, of where they're frustrated, and they're thinking that maybe physics isn't for them, or that maybe it's too hard, um, and that, you know, oh my goodness, um, I, I, I want to try something else. So, so what would you say, or what did you find maybe in your studies and in your career that helped you get, get past those humps and dig yourself out of the pit of despair? Yeah, well, I think the first thing to bear in mind is that we have all been there. Physics is hard for everyone. As you're saying, it was hard for Isaac Newton. You know, it wasn't like Newton just sat down and dreamt up these three laws in a moment. It was hard work thinking about things in great detail, trying out ideas that didn't work at first. We only learn about the success stories in textbooks, but maybe textbooks should have another section where they have all of the failures that needed to be overcome right. before the success story was written into the textbook. I think that's not a bad thing to, to keep in mind. So number one, we've all been there. It's hard for everybody. Number two, the, the gratification of deeply understanding the universe is thrilling. And if you haven't yet had that experience in AP physics, you should definitely stick with it long enough to at least have one of those moments where you're struggling with a problem, you can't figure out what to do, you're beating your head against the wall, and then somehow you see an opening and you solve the problem. And that kind of a move from confusion to clarity, to me, is one of the deepest experiences that you as a human being can have. And if you have one of those experiences and it really grabs hold of you, then you won't be able to leave physics. You will be within the field for life. If, however, it only partially grabs you, and you're like, yeah, that was kind of cool, but you know, I still like reading Shakespeare more, or I still like, you know, prediction, you know, option prices on Wall Street more. There's nothing wrong with leaving and going and doing something else. Physics is not for everybody, but you should at least allow yourself to make that step, to feel what it's like to solve a problem that at first seemed insoluble and see how you react to that. There are many of us for whom that moment was the turning point where like, okay, there is nothing else in the world like that feeling. And I'm going to stick with this no matter how hard it gets. All right. Well, I, I think we're at about time. So I, I just want to say thanks again so much for taking the time to, to talk to us today and uh, giving us a, a little peek into your knowledge and expertise. And uh, well, it's my pleasure. Thank you. I enjoyed again. the conversation. Thanks you so much. Thanks.